Our next speaker will be Sharon Savage. <clears throat> Sharon was appointed in 2006 uh, in DCEG in the clinical genetics branch. She's currently chief and senior investigator and is doing some exciting work with telomere biology. And her subject is family studies, cancer etiology, and telomere biology. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and, and talk about our work. It's a great honor to be here as we recognize the many, many accomplishments of Dr. Farmini in family studies. And it's a real honor also to be a representative of our clinical genetics branch and the genetics program in DCEG. And I'd like to actually to start with Beyond Lee Farmini syndrome, which clearly is had a huge impact, I wanted to highlight some of the other seminal uh, papers and topics in, that have resulted from the efforts in family studies and studying um, the astute the um, studies by the astute clinician um, with Bob Miller and um, Dr. Farmini. So, Wilms tumor um, and iridia congenital malformations, those first papers came out um, from these efforts in early uh, DCEG before it was called DCEG. We have familial chronic lymphocytic leukemia in which there are still very active efforts in genomics in understanding this disorder, and those first papers came out in 1969. Myotonic dystrophy, now this is something that has, has come actually full circle and back to the clinical genetics branch because Dr. Fromini actually wrote, a, and Fred Lee and others wrote a letter to the editor of a co-occurrence of leukemia and myotonic dystrophy in, in a patient. And several years ago, Mark Green in the clinical genetics branch was contacted by a doctor from the myotonic dystrophy registry who said, you know, I think there's more cancer in these patients than we thought. And so they went on to create a great collaboration with Mark and Shahina's Gadala and the, the myotonic dystrophy registry. And sure enough, these patients do have markedly increased risk of cancer compared with the general population. And there's a large effort um, going on to validate and look at the molecular characteristics. But it started with these small, these observations. We have familial Hodgkin's disease, family studies in that arena. Hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, six families reported um, with ovarian cancer, which set the stage for, as we all know, BRCA1 and 2 in many different levels. Family studies of melanoma, which um, had been um, initiated and within DCEG and really focused on studying these high-risk families. We now have multiple new susceptibility genes, including POT1, a telomere gene that was just published a few months ago from our, our division. We have neurofibromatosis and its association with childhood leukemia. Chordoma, also it's still a very active research um, effort in the division, um, led um, by uh, Dillis Perry and others, where Rose Yang in DCEG has recently um, has been following up many new um, exciting hits in this not a core developmental disorder. And so I think that this really sets the stage and sort of shows you the breadth and depth and really how much we can learn from studying these rare inherited cancer syndromes. And that's exactly what I'm doing now. And I'd like to um, transition and I'm going to tell you a small piece of what we're doing now in telomere biology disorders and dyskeratosis congenita. And we do also have a piece in telomere molecular epidemiology, which I don't have time to talk about. But the combination, and by being in a division that has been sort of founded in studying these rare families to understand biology of cancer, we've really been able to learn a lot about our patients with dyskeratosis congenita and telomere biology. So telomeres, this is a graph of um, telomere length and its decline with age. The, this was um, telomere length by flow fish, so flow cytometry with in situ hybridization on lymphocytes. Telomere length is on the y-axis, age is on the x-axis, and you can see a very um, sort of 
a straightforward decline with age. This is telomeres shortened with each cell division. This is a normal decline. And these graphs are going to be very important in a little bit as I talk about the first percentile, this black line, and the 99th percentile. So 99% of our participants are going to be in between these, these um, normal range. Telomeres are critical components of chromosomal stability. So they cap the ends of chromosomes, and they're much more than just a DNA repeat. They're, they're a long hexameric DNA repeat and also a protein complex that cap the ends of eukaryotic chromosomes. Now, telomeres shorten with each cell division, and when they get too short, cellular senescence or apoptosis and death are triggered. And that's part of the normal cell cycle. In, in cells that have a defective P53 dependent DNA damage checkpoint, they actually, cells continue to divide despite having critically short telomeres because they upregulate things like P53 and RB and telomerase. And they continue to divide despite having critically short telomeres. And this results in some of those chromosome fusions and chromosome breaks that, and aneuploidy that we see so often in cancer cells. And cancer cells continue to divide because they upregulate telomerase or they use an alternative lengthening of telomeres uh, recombination based mechanism. So now I'm going to talk only about germline telomere length. And when I think of germline telomere length, it's really a continuum where we have normal ranges of telomere length in between the 1st and 99th percentile, and telomere molecular epidemiology is really looking at statistical differences between populations, and there are a lot of association studies that have looked at the association between telomere length in the germline, usually in blood or buccal cells, and risk of cancer, of heart disease, and a lot of other um, illnesses that affect the general population. I'm not going to talk about that, but instead I'm going to focus on our patients who have incredibly short germline telomeres. And this is really at the other end of that spectrum, where you have very short germline telomeres because you have mutations in um, a, a key gene in, in t involved in telomere biology. So this all stems from the NCI's and clinical genetics branches inherited bone marrow failure syndrome study. Blanche Alters, the PI, and, and the study's been open for more than 12 years now. Neelam Gary is the key staff clinician uh, for the study. And it's a longitudinal prospective cohort study of cancer incidents and in the um, most, in the more common um, inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. It involves detailed questionnaires, medical record review, and evaluation at the NIH Clinical Center, which is probably its greatest, not probably, it is its greatest strength, because we're able to bring participants here to see not just the bone marrow failure team, but also to see all the subspecialists that are relevant to their disease. And as a result, our, even our subspecialists have seen more Fanconi anemia, more dyskeratosis congenita patients than any other specialist in that field. And this has resulted in many different um, um, studies that have advanced our understanding of the phenotypes, including oral and dental phenotypes, lung problems, um, the eye problems our patients have, endocrine problems, neuropsychiatric problems, and many others. So dyskeratosis congenita is an inherited telomere biology disorder that's characterized by marked increased rates of cancer and of bone marrow failure. Patients have this classic diagnostic triad of abnormal nails, skin pigmentation, and oral leukoplakia, but they can have a host of other medical problems. It's really a true multisystemic disease. There's a severe form of dyskeratosis congenita called horial reederson syndrome, or HH for short, and that those patients have all of these complications, plus they have cerebellar hypoplasia and severe immunodeficiency. And I'm going to talk a lot more about HH in a little bit. But what really unites this broad clinical spectrum is abnormally short telomeres and germline mutations. So our DC cohort study to date has ascertained 90 classic DC or HH patients. We have a subset of, of about 21 families who have a, um, a DC-like phenotype, so not quite enough to, for the classic diagnosis, but close, and they are definitely in that spectrum. Just over half of the affected individuals and their family members have been seen at the NIH Clinical Center by our teams. And this led to what um, was one of the, was really the, is the first and the only study that has um, 
quantified cancer risk in our DC patients. So Blanche Alter did this analysis with help from Phil Rosenberg in DCEG, where we looked at the um, cancer incidence in our patients and the bone marrow failure rates. And what this just shows is that by about age 50, about half of our patients will have had severe bone marrow failure. Um, the rates of solid tumors in AML are, are also extremely high. And the um, observed to expected ratios of especially tongue cancer and MDS are exceedingly high compared with the general population. So back 10 or 15 years ago when all of this was getting started, we didn't have a good diagnostic test for DC. And I just told you it was very clinically heterogeneous and it's difficult to make that diagnosis a lot of times because patients don't develop the classic features at the same rates or at the same ages. So what we looked at was with, in collaboration with Peter Landstorp, looked at flowfish telomere lengths. These are those same curves. And this is our follow-up study where we showed that lymphocyte telomere lengths less than the first percentile for age were more than 95% sensitive and specific for DC. And this test has since become CLIA certified. It's the gold standard measurement. And it has really changed how we manage our patients with DC. It's also changed how we select our bone marrow transplant donors because we now can identify clinically silent carriers who, if their telomeres are down here, really are not appropriate donors. And this all comes back because we didn't know all of the genes that cause DC, uh, but we're working on that. This test, in addition to better classifying our patients and their potential bone marrow donors, it has also led to our discovery of many new dyskeratosis congenita genes. So in 2006, this was what DC looked like from a genetic perspective. If this is, if this is a telomere, we had germline mutations in the X-linked form caused by dyscarin mutations, which is part of the telom telomerase holoenzyme complex. We have dominant mutations in between 5 and 10 or 12 percent of our cases in telomerase or TERC, its RNA component. And these are all key components of extending that nucleotide repeat. But about 70% of our patients, even those who met the classic clinical diagnosis, um, did not have a mutation in one of these genes. And I'm going to sort of walk you through how we got to this point. And our, our, our figures keep getting more complicated as we understand more and more of the genetic causes. So the first gene that we found was a gene called TIN2. And that was because of this family that had four affected individuals with classic DC. And this was in the early days of the study. And, and uh, uh, Blanche said, well, let's get telomere length on everyone in this family who we possibly can. And what we found was that the proband had two brothers who had really short telomeres. They're here in this open squares. So they fit a molecular potential diagnosis, even though they didn't have the clinical phenotype. So I did a linkage scan and found that there were germline mutations in exon 6 of the TINF2 gene, which is a key component of the shelter and telomere protection complex. And that has since led to many other studies, and we now know that there's a hot spot in exon 6 that causes mutations in about 20 percent, that causes about 20 percent of autosomal dominant DC. We've also done candidate gene studies, and this is a study that showed germline mutations, compound heterozygous, so recessive mutations in TCAB1, which is encoded by RAP53, which notably is antisense to P53 in the genome, caused DC by causing aberrant telomerase localization in the nucleus. So telomerase is there, but it can't get assembled appropriately and, to, and get to the telomere to do its job. And then most recently, we've undertaken exome sequencing studies. And this was um, because we have developed a wonderful pipeline for exome sequencing at DCEG's Cancer Genomics Research Lab, or CGR. And the team there has been instrumental in helping us understand the, genomic, the genetic causes of multiple cancer syndromes. So we started with these two families with, very, with individuals who had classic DC or HH, the severe variant, and very, very short telomeres for their age. We have a specific variant filtering strategy, and then we do technical validation. We found in those two families germline mutations in RTEL1, and as we kept looking and did more sequencing, we've actually got up to six patients, sorry, six families with germline mutations in RTEL1. And this is actually, gets complicated because we have some families where it looks like there's a dominant disease with genetic anticipation, which is reported in DC, and we've seen it many times. And we also have families with compound heterozygous autosomal recessive mutations who have more severe disease. And we and others have found 
found that there are um, that Artel one is is a very um, is more common cause of HH than we than we maybe thought. Artel one is an essential DNA helicase. It was first studied in the mouse. It's essential for the metabolism of DNA secondary structures and for replication. And I um, just came back from a telomere meeting last week, and Artel one was a big topic because we're really now that we understand we have mutations in different domains of the protein, we're better able to understand the function of this protein in DNA replication and quadruplex formation and telomere biology. So the other really notable thing about Artel is that in addition to our DC-associated mutations that occur in the helicase domains or in the pit box or the PCNA domains, and they're also truncating mutations here, Artel-1 has SNPs in, in intron 12 and intron 17 that multiple different studies have found associated with increased risk of glioma. And I think that Artel is actually starting to look a little bit like TERT, about with TERT and the CLPTM1L locus, where we, th that locus now has at least 10 different cancers associated with, with it. And we're wondering, is Artel one there also in this, in this kind of uh, type of gene where germline mutations can cause a severe disease and SNPs maybe cause increased risk of cancer? Because TERT also causes dyskeratosis congenita. So then this came from also um, from a wonderful collaboration um, with John Petrini, who's at Sloan Kettering, and Ken Offit. So um, Ken had identified this family, um, and John had done some sequencing, and they were trying to figure out the, the cause. And, and these two probands had HH, so the severe variants of DC. And we had this family, and I was talking to John at a meeting, and you know, sure enough, we had two families, both of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, who had the exact same homozygous mutation at arginine 1264 to histidine. So we um, started working together on these two very interesting families and found that our patient cells had really had a true severe telomere defect in that they didn't have, um, they really had loss of telomeres, which in the controls, you see these little green dots, those are the telomere staining. Um, our patients have very heterogeneous or telomeric loss. And then you also have inability of the cells to resolve and appropriately kind of protect that telomeric structure at the end. We also did genotyping across that locus, and we found that our both the affected individuals and their parents were carriers of the exact same haplotype that, this didn't quite translate over here, but the mutation is down here, and the pink haplotype is the exact same um, haplotype in both families. This allele frequency of R1264H was only about one in not quite 10,000 individuals from the publicly available databases. But this really showed us maybe there's something different going on in the Ashkenazi Jewish population of which our families were both members. So this was due to the persistence of, a, of a, the mother of our patient who said um, she was participating with the Doria Shoram um, program at the Center for Jewish Genetics in New York, and she said to them and to me, you guys have got to work together, figure this out, what's going on in this population. And so the group um, genotyped about a 1,000 individuals of Orthodox Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry that were all proven to be unrelated. We always looked for that. Um, and then, or at least closely, um, all proven to be unrelated. And then with Mount Sinai Genetic Testing Laboratory, also genotyped the same variant in about 2,200 individuals from the general Ashkenazi population. And when um, they called me with the results, I, we were all shocked in that we found that in the Orthodox population, about a 1 in 100 carrier frequency for heterozygotes of this R1264H mutation. And in the general Ashkenazi Jewish population, it was about a 1 in 220 or so allele frequency. So when you look back and look at what genetic testing and prenatal um, family planning recommends, a 1 in 100 frequency is actually pretty similar to that that's recommended for screening for um, for uh, other genetic disorders in this population, including things like Bloom syndrome, Fanconi anemia due to the founder mutation, and many others that are that are now screened. And so we're um, currently um, have um, this paper under review because we're recommending that Artel R1264H be added to their prenatal uh, genetic testing panel. 
And so with that, I'll end and say, you know, we've learned a lot about DC genetics by studying these special families in our, with our um, outstanding clinical and genetics team in that we now have, um, others have found mutations in telomere capping proteins as a rare cause of DC. We found TIN2, which accounts for about 20% of DC. Telomerase trafficking due to TCAB1 mutations in about 3% of our patients. RTEL1 um, mutations in about 8 or so percent of our, of our patients. And so now we're up to about 75% of our patients with DC who have a known uh, mutation. And this has really helped our families understanding their disease, helping them um, and helping us better manage them by selecting appropriate donors for their, if they need a bone marrow transplant. But we still have a ways to go and we have several, many other families in our exome sequencing pipeline that we're, that we're actively working on. So I will end with, with um, thanking everyone. Our patients are unbelievable. Um, this was them at, a at their second family meeting. And in 2008, we had a, a meeting uh, um, for patients and doctors and scientists of, of, with, about dyskeratosis congenita, and we helped them form their first family support group. Before that, they had nothing. And now they've had two camp meetings. The third one is this fall, and we're working on their clinical guidelines book, which they, again, don't have. And then our study team, as I've mentioned throughout, um, especially uh, Blanche and Neelam, Barry Ballou is the postdoc who's done all of our exome sequencing analysis, and I didn't have time to talk about our multitude of functional studies that have only been made possible because of our biospecimen collections that we can do within the Family Studies Program. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much.